This video has been a long overdue after my video on the exercise pillars for the fastest muscle growth. I've been asked under that video and in the physiology community if I'll deliver on my promise of the best practices for muscle growth from a nutrition standpoint. Well, here we are. I'll be leaning on my master's in exercise physiology, my past experiences, and above all, numerous studies to show you what you should consider doing if you wanna build muscle the fastest way possible, naturally. That said, I'll go over multiple aspects, but we'll be getting into some of the nuances later on, as well as some major takeaways to apply to your life. So stick out to the end, because things will get more and more hard hitting as we go along. The first pillar, energy. So what you need to do is rub some crystals all over your body to unleash the internal energy. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about food energy. Uh, why does this uh, matter and how does this work? Well, let me start by explaining that for your muscle cells to grow, there needs to be an imbalance in a process called proteostasis, which is the balance of protein synthesis versus protein breakdown. If you are synthesizing more proteins inside your cells than breaking down, then you are likely growing muscle as the cell needs to expand to accommodate that new protein accrued. Now, if we zoom into that further, the process of protein synthesis is controlled by a master molecule called mTOR. When mTOR is activated via a tag applied to it called phosphorylation, mTOR will further tag other proteins. Some proteins it will then inhibit, like 4-EBP1, and some it will excite or activate, like S6K. That information comes from these two studies. Okay, one more step and then I'll bring us back up for a breath of translatable air. The activation of S6K and inhibition of 4-EBP1, along with other factors, leads to more mRNA, which is the transcript from your genes, to be translated to the proteins through the protein synthesis machinery called the ribosomes. So let's say that you lift weights. Your cells receive a signal for growth through similar molecular cascades like the ones that I just described and leads to more reading or expression of genes that hold the information for key proteins needed for the cell to adapt to the training stimulus. These genes are read, expressed, and that leads to their information being transcribed into mRNA. This mRNA is then acted upon by the aforementioned ribosomes to produce the actual protein that your cell will then use to bolster itself against further resistance training. And that's how you get stronger and bigger, you jacked animal you. As usual, I've skipped a lot of steps for time's sake, but hopefully you have a bit better understanding of what's happening inside your cells to lead to this actual muscle growth. Yet, that doesn't explain where food energy comes in here. The food that you consume is biochemically broken down through your metabolism. If that's glycolysis metabolism for carbohydrates or beta oxidation metabolism for your fats. The end result is always ATP or adenosine triphosphate and GTP or guanosine triphosphate. These molecules have distinct effects in protein synthesis in two major ways, although more could be argued. One, ATP can bind directly to mTOR and stimulate its activity, according to this review and accompanying studies. This, of course, would lead to the downstream effects that we discussed. Two, both ATP and GTP are involved in the ribosome reading or translating of the mRNA into a protein. The GTP allows the ribosome to move down the mRNA, translating it as it moves. And the ATP is responsible for the attachment of amino acids, those are the building blocks of proteins, onto the molecules called tRNA. All of this is part of the protein synthesis machinery. So on a cellular level, it makes a lot of sense that if there were fewer GTP and ATP molecules around, there's less stimulation of the protein synthesis. But is that what we actually see on the muscle level? Well, these researchers food restricted people for a few days, and even in that short period of time, they showed a 19% reduction in protein synthesis, 
although protein was the same between the non-energy restricted group and the energy restricted group. Additionally, there was less inhibition, so greater activity of that protein synthesis inhibitor protein for EBP1 that we discussed earlier. So the white bar is the amount of inhibitory phosphorylation by mTOR on this protein synthesis inhibitor in the energy deficit group. As we see, it's lower, meaning that protein synthesis inhibitory protein 4-EBP1 is likely more active. On the other hand, there have been a few studies looking at muscle growth in people who consume more food energy than their body needs. For example, this pilot study, people did just that. They overconsumed, and they were able to gain muscle. The black bar group consumed more, but both consumed more than they needed, so they both gained muscle. Okay, so the takeaway here is you must be consuming enough food to gain muscle. And how much is enough food, you ask? Well, we'll come back to that. The second pillar, protein. Who saw this one coming from miles away? <laughs> I sure didn't, as the dumbest physiologist that there ever was. This one seems pretty obvious, but why is protein important? And is there an upper limit for benefit? And are there some other considerations that aren't as obvious? Well, the first question is pretty easy. We'll go back to our protein synthesis machinery. I briefly mentioned that ATP is needed to load amino acids onto tRNA, which then get used by the ribosomes to stitch together proteins for muscle growth. Those amino acids come from none other than the protein that you consume. You consume protein, your body digests it into the constituent parts called amino acid molecules, absorbs it, then delivers them to the muscle cell, and then they get latched onto this tRNA to form a new protein. But instead of the previous protein that was part of the muscle for a cow or part of a plant, it now belongs to you as an enzyme or some structural unit of the cell or anything else that your genes can create. Okay, that's the most obvious influence of protein on muscle protein synthesis. But there's another related to mTOR, that master stimulator of protein synthesis from earlier. One potent amino acid that is found in some proteins is called leucine. This leucine amino acid has a host of different ways that it can stimulate mTOR. It can physically bind to proteins called RAGs that ultimately recruit and activate mTOR, or it can inhibit an inhibitor of mTOR called Gator. If you're staring at me with uh, blank eyes, wondering uh, what in all this world that we're talking about, RAGs and Gators, <laughs> I don't blame you. Uh, that's a miniature taste of the complexity of molecular biology. There's more to be found in this scientific review. Ultimately, just know that this amino acid, along with others that I won't go over now, stimulate mTOR activity. And that isn't even to mention the other side of the proteostasis that we've been discussing, degradation. Leucine and other amino acids, along with increased food energy in the form of ATP, also reduce cellular degradation, thereby strongly slanting the cell towards muscle accretion rather than breakdown. The complexities of proteostasis are for another time, so let's just move on. What we now know is that for multiple reasons, protein consumption is key to building muscle. Then the next question is, how much? Well, if we crack open a scientific review on the topic, the researchers therein point out that we should be consuming somewhere between the range of 1.6 to 2.2 grams of protein per kilogram of weight to maximize protein synthesis and muscle growth. But total protein is not enough of a consideration. It's also important to consider the amino acid profile of that protein. The major amino acid consideration is leucine. Leucine is the most potent stimulator of mTOR among amino acids. Having a high protein intake, but having a low leucine intake will yield subpar results compared to consuming adequate leucine as well. Fortunately, many foods contain large amounts of leucine, which you can easily find with a quick search. However, to give you a target, the goal is to reach around two to three grams of leucine per meal, ideally three. So if you consume 40 grams of protein in a meal, ideally it should contain three grams of leucine. The third pillar, carbohydrates. This one is a bit controversial because it probably doesn't matter much if you already consume even a modest amount of carbohydrates in your diet. But if you're one of those keto low lives, those freaks of nature, 
<laughs> I'm kidding. I love the low carb. Uh, but if you follow a very low carbohydrate diet, uh, there is some mixed evidence indicating that it may not be the best scenario for muscle growth. And why is that? When we exercise through weightlifting, we tend to rely significantly on glucose, carbohydrates, for energy generation. Remember when we touched on glycolysis earlier? That's the pathway that allows us to convert carbohydrates into a usable cellular energy, ATP. That ATP is not only used in protein synthesis, but allows your muscle cells to contract in a process called cross-bridge cycling of two proteins called actin and myosin. Anyway, without getting too much into the weeds where we might get eaten by a gator, see, recall to earlier in the video, <laughs> but uh, this time it's an actual gator, not a protein within uh, the cell signaling mTOR. So, Okay, anyway, we need a ton of ATP to allow our muscles to contract. And while fat molecules are an excellent source of ATP, our cells generate ATP through fat at a much slower rate. So they rely on carbohydrate metabolism, glycolysis, to get the ATP necessary for short bursts of activity, like weightlifting. On a ketogenic or other very low carbohydrate diets, the muscle and liver cells are massively deprived of stored glucose, carbohydrate, and there's none being consumed, so that glycolysis system suffers. As a result, getting sufficient exercise volume can be more difficult since your muscles simply don't have the ability to contract over and over again at higher weights. That said, there's some nuances here, like it may not matter for measures of power and strength since the exercise is so short, literal seconds, but may matter more when you're approaching those eight, nine, 10, or higher repetition ranges. There may be some other reasons that low carbohydrate diets aren't optimal for muscle hypertrophy, so that's muscle growth, but I'll get into those uh, another time. Ultimately, it is still possible to gain muscle on a very low carbohydrate diet, just more difficult than if a person consumes even a modest amount of carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are a pillar relative to very low carbohydrate diets, but probably not much of one in respect to other carbohydrate diets, according to this review. The idea is to consume enough to keep your tissue level saturated, and that is estimated to be at the lower end of the range, around three grams per kilogram, according to these researchers. But even they acknowledge the true number may actually even be lower. Ultimately, the takeaway here is that you may want to consider eating more than 20 grams of carbohydrates a day because it will likely impact your gym performance, which will reduce your muscle growth from repeated bouts of suboptimal workouts. I wouldn't worry about the exact optimal milligram of carbohydrates, but it's probably not really going to matter for you. Okay, so how might you think about all of this? Here's the straightforward answer, the please be crystal clear, this is for the fastest muscle growth with no considerations for anything else. You need to be gaining weight, point blank. The first pillar comes down to eating enough food that you are slowly but surely gaining weight. This only applies to people who are not severely overweight. To be even more exact, you need to get on that scale, or if you don't like scales, use a measuring tape for your arms, legs, midsection, and you need to see those numbers slowly creeping upwards. Second, you need to be consuming a minimum of 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram, and if you're already quite lean, you may wanna bump it up further in that range, like two grams per kilogram of weight. And don't forget about that two to three grams of leucine threshold per meal. Finally, consider consuming 100 plus grams of carbohydrates a day, probably more. Now, there are plenty of other scientifically backed tips like protein timing, pre-sleep food consumption, sleep itself, and much more. But these three, especially the first two, assuming that sleep is also solid, will get you 90% there. I can cover those more nuanced aspects another time, but I'll tell you something that I didn't mention. You won't build much muscle if you don't resistance train. So if you got value from this video, you should definitely check out this next video on optimal resistance training for muscle growth because I lay it all out there like I did here. Or if you're interested in more nutrition, check out this one. But I'm telling you, without resistance training, none of this matters. So if you'll indulge my bro self, do you even lift brah?